in my tree. Big tree, ficus tree. It's gotten monstrous. It's bigger than my house. I let it go too long. And so I pulled out my I trimmer. I have a hedge trimmer, and it's on an extension pole, so I can get it about, about eight feet, eight and a half, nine feet long. And, and, and I'm, I'm up on the, I climb up on the ladder, and I'm, 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 I'm trimming and trimming. And it's funny because I'm, I've had this, this hedge trimmer for about, about 15 years. It's been a good, it's been a good trimmer. And the blade's on it, about like this, you know, and, and, and it extends out. And I do all that stuff. So I'm up there trimming away, and I, and I look down, and I think, huh. I wonder what that bolt is right there. And it, it's got this bolt. And I've seen it there. I mean, I know it's been there. I've had this thing forever. I've just, I'm always just doing my thing, and I don't really ever, I've never, I've never bothered with it at all. And I thought, I'm looking at the mechanism. I'm going, you know what? I think I pulled that bolt out of that thing, and it turns in pieces. You can do 20, 45-degree angle. For 15 years. I had no idea. Um, in Christianity, we have um, three major holidays. Better, I mean, you, you know, I know you know two of them right off the top of your head, right? First one is what? Christmas, right? Second one would be? And now, those of you who think you know what the third major international Christian holiday is, let me see your hands real quick. Let me just see. See? You're Baptist. You have no idea. Pentecost. Did you know that? That is the third major international Christian celebrated event because... Pentecost is the celebration, the remembering of the coming of the Holy Spirit. So today, if you didn't gather by all the music, today is Pentecost. It is the, um, so, and here's how they do it, and I'm probably getting into stuff I'm going to cover later, but let me just say it this way. If you're, if you're Greek, if you're, if, you're, if you're not Jewish, you wouldn't necessarily know this. We call it Pentecost. Do you know what Penta me Pentecost means, right? All you math people. Penta means 50. 50, Pentecost, 50. It was the Greek way of, of numbering what was called the Feast of Weeks in the Jewish calendar. Um, so let me, let me just say it this way. Um, when God sends... In the Old Testament, when, when God wanted to do something, he sent the, his spirit. And the spirit of God would come and would go. Where He would just come, he, God would send him on a mission, he'd go and do his thing, he'd come back, and that would be it. It was just, that's how the spirit of God worked in the Old Testament. Here's one of the ways you know that. If you, you're not going to turn there, but in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2, here's what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God, when God wanted to create, when God wanted to move, when God wanted to shape the earth, the Spirit of God was hovering, was doing the work. The Spirit of God is, is present at the very beginning of creation. Um, when you get down in chapters, chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, just before the flood, there's another very interesting quote. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, it says that God's Spirit will not always strive with man or convict. That's what the Spirit of God does. When, when you look in through the Old Testament, the 39 books that are in the Old Testament, 20 of those books have a direct reference to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And in all of those cases, what's happening is the Spirit of God is, is, has a, a purpose that He is trying to fulfill. And so he, he goes, God sends Him, and He goes and fulfills a very specific purpose. And when you get to the New Testament, specifically Acts chapter 2, everything changes. This whole thing is about to change. Now, here's a little bit of context for this because we've not 
led up to this, so you haven't had any context. So let me give you a little bit of background. There are, there are seven Jewish um, holiday celebrations every year, at festivals, if you will. Three of them are required. In other words, every male, every Jewish male was required, every convert was required to come to Jerusalem three times a year for these three feasts, these three festivals. And you, you, they'll sound familiar to you, at least a couple of them will. The first one was called the Feast of Tabernacles. It was where they all got together and they lived during that feast in little mini lean-to tents, tabernacles, huts. It was to remind them, you know the story, it was to remind them of when they were wandering in the wilderness and they spent 40 years living like that. So it was a reminder of how God delivered them out of Egypt and they spent those 40 years and God provided for them in the wilderness. So every year, you, if you were Jewish, you had to go, it was required, a male had to go to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. So that's one of the feasts. The second feast was called the Feast of uh, First Fruits. Now, oh, by the way, Every one of these festivals had a, a harvest related to it. So Tabernacles was following the feast of uh, grapes and olives. It was in the fall. Now you get to the f- first fruits, and it was the barley harvest. So what would happen is they'd go and they'd get their, their they'd start the harvest, they'd get the first fruits. And they would bring them up, and it was a way of saying to God, thank you for providing the harvest, thank you for providing the barley, thank you for the, the, the olives and the grapes, and they would come in and they would do that. And, and this feast in particular, this feast of, of first fruits, was at the same time as Passover. Now that's significant. In just a second, I'll show you why. So they have Passover. Well, that was the celebration. It was to remind them, again, they come for these harvests, these feasts. Passover was to remind them of how God delivered them, how God saved them, how the death angel passed over those who believed, those who had the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. That death angel passed over. He didn't, didn't, the firstborn didn't die. And so they had this feast of first fruits to remind them of this, to be thankful for God's provision. After that comes this feast of weeks. And the instruction in the Old Testament is seven weeks after Passover. Seven full weeks after Passover. On the next day, which would be the which day? 50th day. That's where we get the 50 from, the Pentecost from. They called it the Feast of Weeks. Gentiles called it Pentecost. 50 days after Passover, they get together for um, this, this, the, the wheat. It was the, the harvest of the wheat. And here's the other thing that they did. It was the same time also that they recognized God giving the people of Israel the Torah on Mount Sinai to Moses. Fifty days after coming out of Egypt, they're up on the mountain, and God gives them the law. And so they were required to come and to remember that. Called it the Feast of Weeks because it was seven weeks. And then after that. So there's kind of the story, and I want to show you one more thing before we get, we're we're working our way to the text. We'll be there in a minute. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 is a very interesting passage. After having told you about the Feast of First Fruits, listen carefully. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. The first fruits. The first of the harvest. Jesus Christ was the first fruits. He was the first to die, come back to life, and to live forevermore, never to die again. Jesus was the first fruit. And everybody after that who would follow would be the rest of the harvest. Paul is drawing a pretty cool little analogy here to the first fruits of the harvest and Passover, and in we go. All right, so I titled the message, How Does God Do That? from Acts chapter 2. And as you, you, you pull up, and if you've got your outlines, you can kind of follow along. We're going to go there. Let me give you one more little thought here. Um, have you ever looked at space? Maybe you've seen the pictures. Maybe you've seen the, the Hubble telescope shots of, of the universe and different shots. Have you ever looked at that and gone, how does God do that? How in the world does that happen like that? Who holds all this stuff together? Is it, how, how can it be that all of that just kind of continues without falling into utter chaos? How does God do that? Um, how many of you have, um, well, we'll do this one, because you almost have to have grandchildren to have seen one of these. 
You got grandchildren? Anybody got one of those little cute little little in utero sonograms? Remember when they gave you the sonogram? Oh, that was so cool. My daughter-in-law, who had my first granddaughter, brought me a 3D. A 3D. You're looking at this six-week-old 3D baby in the womb, and you can see hair. You can, everything. It's 3D. I don't know how. They, how does God do that? By the way, she said, uh, she goes, when she first got pregnant, first child, right? She'd say, it's, the baby's the side of a grape seed. And then next week, the baby's the side of a pea. The, the baby's the side of a, of a grape. The baby's the side of a, of a plum. The baby's the size of a... And then you get this, and then she comes home and shows you the 3D picture, and you go, how does God do that? How does God do these things? How does God free somebody from an addiction that's been ruining them, killing them? I got a nephew right now that is killing himself, literally. How does God set you free? How does He do that? How does the power of God do that in our lives? How does the God bring healing? How, do, how does God do it when someone spends their entire life rejecting Jesus and saying, no, 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 and somewhere in the middle of that, God saves them? How does God do that? Want to take a guess? Let's look at it. Look at Acts chapter 2. Um, you've got um, Acts chapter 1 is, uh, I'm still, this is the longest introduction I've ever done for you. Um, Acts chapter 1, there's so much stuff that goes ahead of this and I just kind of have to set the stage for you. Acts chapter 1 is the story of um, the, you've got Jesus, right? Because it's Passover, right? So you've had Passover, you've had the crucifixion, you've had the resurrection. And after the resurrection, New Testament says that Jesus showed himself to his disciples for 40 days. For 40 days, he's making appearances, he's seeing his disciples, he's talking to them to, and he gets them up on the mountain, and he says to them, by the way, up on the mountain in the north, he says, wait, don't go anywhere. Go to Jerusalem and wait for, well, he says, what I told you about. I told you this. It's not the first time. Go back and wait until the coming of the Holy Spirit, till the promised Spirit is how he says it. So, so he leaves, and they go back down to Jerusalem, and you'll never guess how many days later the Holy Spirit came. Ten more days. On day 50, on Pentecost. God takes what was at one time the giving of the Torah, the celebration, and now He gives them the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Okay, here's the text. I said, number one, how does God do that? He does it when the Holy Spirit comes. That's how God does it. The Holy Spirit comes. Look at verse 1 through 12. We'll read through here. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Uh, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, uh, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? That's another way of saying, how does God do that? What, what is this? God sends 
the, the disciples are in the upper room. The Spirit of God comes. God sends the Spirit of God. And it says that he, he comes to empower and to live in the disciples. The Holy Spirit of God <laughs> hovers over them and then takes over them, fills them, indwells them. And it says that the disciples speak, at least by count, 15 or 16 different languages, which they do not know. From, because the people have come from all over the world. They have to come. It's the, it's the celebration. It's one of the three required feasts and festivals. They have to come. They, Jews and converts to Judaism, males must come, required. They're all there. They get there, and suddenly they're hearing in their own language from people that they know don't speak it. They're hearing about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're hearing what God has done, the miraculous event that has taken place, the resurrection, that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Passover lamb. It, this, he's the one that we've been waiting for. It's Jesus. That's what the Spirit of God does. God sends His Spirit at this very specific time, right at this moment of the celebration, 50 days, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the law, and now the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everything shifts. So, why, you kind of wonder, well, why does God do that? Well, before this, Jesus is with the disciples. Jesus is the relationship. He's God in flesh. He's the one that's connecting them to the Father, and everything is all right there. And then when Jesus leaves, the disciples are going, well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are we going to do? You, you can't just leave us. I have to. If I don't leave, the Holy Spirit doesn't come. The promise, the one who's going to not just kind of be there wherever in person whenever you need. No, no. He is always with you. He indwells you. You become, as the New Testament writers say, the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Followers of Jesus Christ, it is the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, His presence. Read Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Here's what it says. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. That's the shift. The Spirit comes. Not comes and goes, not shows up and does His thing and leaves. The Spirit of God is coming. He comes over the disciples, indwells the disciples, fills the disciples. This is a permanent residing. Now, the Spirit of Christ is with you always. Never to leave you. So, if you're a, um, and it doesn't matter, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, the Spirit of God indwells you, fills you, leads you. We're going to see it in a minute. Guides you, does all these things. That's what the Spirit of God's his job. That's what he does. It's Christ's presence, the Father's presence. If, if, you're, if you're still thinking about it, if you're not a Christian, you're watching online, whatever it may be, and you're still thinking about it, and you wonder, guess what? The Spirit of God is pursuing you. He always has. He's pursuing you. He's showing up. He, he does several things. We'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, how does the Spirit of God pursue somebody? Christian, non-Christian, how does he pursue a non-Christian? Spirit of God comes. Second thing, Spirit of God does what? Number two, convicts. That's how the Spirit of God pursues you. He convicts. Now, I'm going to read for you a couple of these verses. Uh, it's verses 17, 21 to 23, 32, and then 36 to 37. It's, it's, it's a big passage, so I've, I've kind of pulled out some, past, some certain verses here. Starting at verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
I'm going to read that one again just because. I don't want you to miss it. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is not up for debate. This is what Scripture says. You call out, He saves. Verse 22, Follow, uh, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, verse 36, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? This was the first Jerusalem evangelistic crusade. Peter stands up and he starts telling, this is what what has happened. This is what the leaders have done. He says, but this is the one. Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one, the Holy Spirit, what you've just seen here with the coming and the languages and all that and the proclaiming in your life, that's the Holy Spirit that God promised. He, he preaches a message, and if you read the whole message that Peter gives, it's from the Old Testament. He preaches because <laughs> that's what they had, right? He's preaching a message from Joel and Psalms. These are verses that they know. They're familiar with these. He says, these tell us of what God is doing and God's plan. And as Peter preaches this, he's able to connect the dots. All these people who have come from all over the world are suddenly connecting the dots. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean this is God's plan? This is the, this is the, the Passover lamb? This is the Messiah? This is the, this is the resurrection? The crucif- this is forgiveness of sins? He's God? Messiah? The one we've been waiting for? Yes. So the Spirit convicts. That's the Spirit's job. And they, they, they come out of it going, what are, we, what are we supposed to do? Look at John chapter 16. I printed it up here, verses 7 and 8 and 12 to 15. So in this point, Jesus is going to clarify the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus says. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. By the way, if you have a, a, a New American Standard, another translation, it uses the word convict. He will convict the world of sin righteousness, and judgment. Verse 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify Me because it is from Me that He will receive what He will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm going away. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. He can't come until I'm done. I'm leaving you. And everything that I need to say to you, I've already given to the Holy Spirit. He's going to tell you. You don't need to worry about me leaving you. I'm sending the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God guides people, the passage says. He guides us into truth. He, he is on a mission from God. He is carrying the words of Jesus. And he says, in case you want to know, this is the Spirit's job. He convicts us. He convicts us of sin. What's, this is wrong. It's called sin. He convicts us. That's where that comes from. He convicts us of righteousness. What is the right thing to do? Of sin. Here's judgment. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, there is stuff's going to happen. 
somebody says, well, I, I, I feel guilty. Um, my conscience is bothering me. No, it's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit's job, to bring conviction. These people are standing around. They Suddenly, the light comes on. They go, wait a minute. You mean we killed the Messiah? Yes, but he's raised from the dead. Good news. What are we going to do? That's the Holy Spirit. He, and this is what's coming. Um, by the way, and you may have some Muslim friends. Uh, we just finished, wrapped up uh, what they call Ramadan. Big, huge international celebration, right? Here's the interesting thing. People who have friends and Muslim friends, and they, they spend time with them, and they know, and they're praying for them, and they're praying for them. Here's what, here's what the stories that come out of the time of Ramadan. They'll come out. You'll hear the stories. They'll say, so-and-so, I was talking with so-and-so, and they came to me because they said they had a dream and a vision and they saw Jesus coming to them and telling them to believe. How does God do that? He does it through the Spirit. That's the Spirit of God. That's His job. God reveals Himself in the dreams and the visions, and the Spirit of God comes, and He convicts. Okay, third thing. Good, I'm on time. First service was late. I kept them long. We're going to get you out on time. Third thing, the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God, He comes, He convicts. Here's the third thing. The Holy Spirit seals. Look at verses 38 to 41. So this is following up, right? We're just continuing down through the story. They, they, they feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and now they have this response. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. How does God do that? It's the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is, as the text says, the Holy Spirit is God's promise, his seal, his mark of ownership. That's what the text reads. That's what the Holy Spirit does. When, God, when you receive Christ, when you open up your life, you call out for His forgiveness. God sends the Holy Spirit to come just like He did in the early disciples. Sends His Holy Spirit to take up residence in you. It, it, it's not like pre. It's not like Old Testament where the Holy Spirit comes and goes, shows up and does things and leaves. Oh, no, 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 no. He comes in and He never leaves. He is your mark. He is your seal. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. This helps clarify some of this. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Um, when you were little, maybe, if you, maybe you had this experience. I, I had it one time. That's why I remember it. Did you ever get a letter in an envelope and it had a wax seal on the envelope and it was stamped? I got one. I remember because I got it from a little girl in elementary school. She'd written a letter, and she folded it up, and she put it in the envelope, and she put a little, I don't know how she did it. She must have done it at home. And she put a little wax, drop a, you heat up the wax, right? It drops the wax down the thing, and you take something, uh, and you press it down in, and it marks it. It seals it. It dries. You do that because you, that way, if the seal is broken, you know somebody peaked. 
the teacher read your note that she grabbed from you in class. This is not new. The Roman emperors, this is where it comes from. When the Roman emperor wanted to send a letter on official business, they would roll it up, they would take wax, pour it down on there, on the scroll, and he would take his ring, his signet ring, he, he was the only one that had it, and he would push it in and stamp it, and then it would dry. And the rule was, nobody opens it except the person to whom it is sent. And if somebody breaks that seal, somebody's going to die. That's how that worked. The text says um, that the Holy Spirit is your seal. He is your mark. Um, when you bought a house and you signed the contract, you had to put something down on the house. They called it a deposit. A deposit. It was a percentage of the price that you had to pay for the house, right? It was a what? It was a promise. It was a guarantee. I promise I will fulfill the contract. I will, and if I don't, I forfeit my deposit, right? Well, nobody wants to do that. I mean, you put it down. It's a good earnest. You say, I'm going to come. I'm going to fulfill the contract. I'm going to buy the house. I'm going to do whatever it is. What does the text say? When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. You are the letter. The Holy Spirit is the seal. He's the mark. He's the deposit in your life. He's the guarantee that someday when you are delivered to the Father and He breaks the seal and opens up the you. The Holy Spirit is your promise, your guarantee that you will see Him face to face and the Father will open it up and it will be you in His presence. We call that heaven. That's what that is. The Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit seals. He is your promise of heaven. He lives inside of you. He never leaves you. That's his job. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this morning and for an opportunity to be reminded of how much you do love us, what you have done to make all this possible, that you have sent your spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, to live in us, to act as our guide of truth, to, to seal us, to be our guarantee, our deposit, to, to bring conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment to, to come. Father, help us to live like it, to lift up Jesus, to listen to the Holy Spirit, to obey. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. I want to wrap up the service this morning by doing this. I hope, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I hope it doesn't take you 15 years to figure out what the Holy Spirit's for. Oh, I know it's there. I... The Holy Spirit, from the moment of your faith, the Holy Spirit was with you, in you, to convict of sin, what is not right, what is right, righteousness, and what happens if you don't. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit's job. He didn't just, by the way, and I said it to you, it doesn't, it's not just Christians. The Holy Spirit does this in the world because He's drawing people drawing people. It's his job. He's on mission to see lost 
people, addicted people, guilty people. Pick your sin. It doesn't matter. To draw them, to forgive them through Jesus Christ. We want to invite you this morning. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you heard the Holy Spirit say to you this morning, uh, are you paying attention? That's the Holy Spirit saying it's time for you. If you're, maybe you're watching online, maybe you came as a guest here this morning and and you're you're not a Christian, you came because somebody invited you and that's, we're glad to have you. And you felt the same kind of thing pushing you, saying, I, th- I, I think he's talking to you. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is convicting because that's his job. That's what he does. He says, you need Jesus Christ in your life. You need forgiveness. You need God in your life. We want to give you that opportunity this morning. We're going to sing and we're going to open up the front. You can come and you can pray. You're watching online, you can, you can pray right where you are. You can tell Jesus, I believe in you. I need you to forgive me. I believe you, you went to the cross for me. You died for me. You raised from the dead for me. You can do it right where you are. As we sing, you come.